Good afternoon. I'm Erica George, Director of the Tanner Humanities Center and the Samuel D. Thurman Professor of Law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. The University of Utah is on land named for the Ute tribe and is on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The official language of our acknowledgement will be posted in the chat for your reference. The Tanner Humanities Center is named after educator and entrepreneur Obert C. Tanner a philosopher and founder of O.C. Tanner, a philanthropist, and with his wife, Grace Tanner, founded our center. Our center aims to advance humanities exploration and engagement through our three core pillars of academic research, educational enrichment, and public outreach, like our program today. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. You come from London and Sao Paulo. You're signing in from all over the world. We've got guests from Mexico. Um, and Asia as well. So you're joining us for our Obert C. Tanner Lecture on Artificial Intelligence and Human Values, a special series of the International Tanner Lectures Program. Additional lectures on artificial intelligence will also take place at University of California, Berkeley, University of Cambridge, University of Michigan, University of Oxford, Stanford University, and Yale University during the 2021, 2022, and 2022 to 2023 academic years. Before I begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of Carolyn Tanner Irish in June 2021. She was a visionary, a leader, and an inspiration. Carolyn impacted the lives of so many of us on our campus, in our community, and around the world. It is an honor to be housed in the building that bears her name and is also my Zoom background. Um, at the center was dedicated to advancing her family's lifelong commitment to the humanities and human values. To that end, I'd also like to thank her son, Stephen Tanner Irish, chairman of the board of directors at OC Tanner, Dave Peterson, CEO of the OC Tanner Company, Mark Matheson, executive director of the International Tanner Lecture Program, for their support for the Tanner Lectures and the Tanner Humanities Center here at Utah. Finally, to my staff. Beth James, Jeremy Rosen, Susan Anderson, Katie Pula, Hannah Taub, Marika O'Sullivan. Um, without them, they couldn't do the excellent work that we do. And I'm deeply grateful for their contribution to making today a success. And now, our guest, Professor Shoshana Zuboff. Scholar, writer, and activist, Shoshana Zuboff is the author of three major books, each of which signaled the start of a new epoch in technological society. Her recent master work um, pardon me. Um, her bio will be placed in the chat and we have um, an abbreviated bio. So I will urge you to look at that. A scholar, a writer, an activist, Shoshana Zuboff is the author of three major books, each of which signaled the start of a new epoch in technological society. Her recent masterwork, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, an international bestseller has been translated into 26 languages, has been hailed as the tech industry's silent spring and the Das Kapital of the 21st century. Professor Zuboff is the Charles Edward Wilson Professor Emeritus at Harvard Business School and a faculty associate at the Kennedy School's Carr Center for Human Rights. And her work has received recently the Alex Springer Award in 2019, the Epic Lifetime Achievement Award in 2021. And, this is, and she is the first recipient of the Global Privacy Assembly Giovanni Buttarelli Award in 2021. I now turn to Professor Zuba for her Tanner Lectures on Human Values and AI. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I can't believe this day has actually come. We've been discussing this day now for years and it's finally here. And um, I don't know if anyone looking at the screen where you see me speaking is seeing someone else's name, <laughs> but if you are, rest assured that this is me. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to um, greet so many friends from around the world who have signed in today, come to visit. 
and to discuss this crucial topic of our time and of our moment. So my plan for today, my remarks are going to cover, um, let's say three general topics. First of all, I'm going to tell you a true story. And this is, uh, although it's true, it's kind of like a fable that I'm going to put out right at the beginning and all through the rest of my remarks. If you have any confusion or trouble, like what exactly does she mean by that? You can think back to this story and you will find the issue that we're talking about in this story. Then we're going to talk about surveillance capitalism, not only what it is as an economic logic, but what it is as a revolutionary institution. And finally, we're going to talk about the democratic response, what's happening, what needs to happen. So let me begin with a story. I love telling stories. I hope you like them too. This is a tough one. September 2020, just over a year ago, London's Channel 4 News broke a story on the Trump 2016 campaign's efforts to deter Black citizens from voting on election day. The investigative team, by the way, they had broken a lot of the, a lot of the um, really important stories on Cambridge Analytica as well. So they examined more than 5,000 leaked data files with details on 200 million individual American voters, along with the analyses, models, everything, the personality traits, political attitudes, behavioral dispositions, interests, concerns, vulnerabilities, the whole nine yards, all of it was there. And of course, these were assembled in order to individually target and manipulate voter, voter, voter behavior, especially in the key swing states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ohio, and with the view to persuading people not to vote. The campaign's digital director, a man named Brad Parscale, used Facebook's suite of, quote, ad tools to identify citizens least likely to support Trump to, in order to target them for deterrence. It so happens that this, um, this database that they had, these 5,000 data sets, included 3.5 million Black voters. And they were the group that were really targeted, bombarded with corrupt content designed to persuade them to stay away from the voting booths on election day. This was conveyed in a, you know, the standard range of algorithmic targeting mechanisms used in Facebook's advertising, bread and butter mechanisms used every day. Subliminal cues, engineered social comparison, psychological micro-targeting, recommendation tools, real-time rewards and punishments, gamification, and more. These performed exactly as designed. They produce massive scale behavioral change. Black voter turnout declined by seven percentage points, the largest decline on record for Black Americans ever, and even larger in those swing states, a full percent larger, where the, the real bombardment was concentrated. So fast forward to 2020, Facebook executive, Facebook executive, Andrew Bosworth, asked and answered the following question. So was Facebook responsible for Donald Trump getting elected? I think the answer is yes, he said, but not for the reasons anyone believes. Mr. Bosworth laid Trump's success at the feet of Facebook's titanic machine operations, known to the world as online targeted advertising. Mr. Trump, was elected, Bosworth said, quote, because he ran the single best digital ad campaign I've ever seen. They just used the tools we had to show the right creative to each person. Close quote. Parscale confirmed this conclusion in his inimitable style. And he said, I always wonder why people in politics act like this stuff is so mystical. It's the same shit we use in commercial. It just has fancier names. All right, my friends, what happened here? 
citizens of the world's longest lived democracy relinquish their most solemn democratic right, the right to vote, without anyone ever holding a gun to their heads or showing up in the dead of night to threaten them with the gulag or the camp. Instead, these citizens ceded the right to self-govern in response to engineered digital communications freighted with inflammatory messages and disinformation tailored to individual psychological and political profiles until enough people chose to stay home on election day. At least they thought they chose. This is not the totalitarian nightmare of Big Brother who breaks bodies in order to bend souls to his single truth. The work here is accomplished by what I have called instrumentarian power, secretly wrung from artificial intelligence and able to work its will entirely through the medium of digital instrumentation. No blood, no bodies, no fingerprints, no enemy, no combat. Instead, it comes on slippered feet, offering a cappuccino, seamless. Sometimes power arrives careening down the slopes that ring the valley riding at a gallop to crush us at the gates. But in our days of abstraction and mediation, this new power moves lightly, unannounced, odorless, invisible, a poison whose signature is this. The very moment that we become aware of its peril is the moment that is too late. What we see here is the 21st century rendition of the alchemist dream, the transformation of knowledge into power, only now knowledge is artificial intelligence and power is what I shall christen here today as artificial power. These two dimensions have long been conflated to the degradation of our understanding and our right to combat. The moral and political valence of AI depends upon the morality and politics of its data diet and training. But when it comes to AP artificial power, judgment depends upon the morality and politics of its methods and effects. AI is not power. AI is the material from which artificial power is constructed. The economic logic that creates this transformational capability is what I have called surveillance capitalism. And the 2016 story shows surveillance capitalism's basic foundational operations of data extraction, computation, algorithmic targeting and behavior modification, all of them at work, but in this case simply pivoted to political rather than commercial objectives. We see clearly the targeting is only personalization in the sense that individual users are made personally visible through an infinitely long rifle scope, able to discern not only each one's bullseye, but their detailed reaction to the moment of impact. What is surveillance capitalism? I have called it this because the economics that shape these mechanisms maintain core elements of traditional capitalism, private property, market exchange, growth and profit. But these cannot be realized without the technologies and social relations of surveillance. Hidden methods of observation secretly consume human experience until recently considered private. And that is translated into behavioral data. These methods operate outside of human awareness, robbing actors of the right to know and with it, the right to combat. In an extraordinary development, these ill-gotten human data are then immediately claimed as corporate property available for manufacture and sales. 
Google founder Larry Page laid out this new vision in 2001, shortly after the breakthroughs that would change everything. As Page and his team declared their rights to our lives, he reflected, quote, if we did have a category, it would be personal information, the places you've seen, communications, sensors are really cheap, storage is cheap, cameras are cheap. People will generate enormous amounts of data. Everything you've ever heard or seen or experienced will become searchable. Your whole life will be searchable. Close quote. Google had been a technology company. Its business plan called for selling search engine licenses to large internet companies and other corporate clients. But all of that was abandoned. Instead of selling search, Google would achieve revenue growth by selling what it could learn about users as they searched. Escape from financial ruin during the height of the dot-com bust depended upon turning Google search engine into a sophisticated surveillance medium for the clandestine seizure of human data. The theory of surveillance capitalism challenges this property claim and redefines it as theft. In today's surveillance economy, personal information is the stolen treasure and surveillance is the getaway car. The entire economic edifice is built on this illegitimate bed of sand. These data join complex supply chains, travel to computational factories, are computed into behavioral predictions and targeting algorithms, and then finally sold to business customers in a new kind of market that trades in predictive knowledge of human behavior. These are commodity markets, commodity markets now in human futures, akin to markets in pork belly futures or wheat or oil. Surveillance capitalism sells the promise of certainty, a promise which requires data extraction and computation at unprecedented and therefore unimaginable scale. So the economic logic was discovered, invented, and honed at Google. And the first globally successful human futures markets came to be known as online targeted advertising. And then between 2001, when these discoveries were first applied, and 2004, when the company went public, we got a look at the results of this new economic logic. Google's revenue line during those years increased by 3,590%. That is the surveillance dividend. And it reset the bar for investors and companies alike. Targeted advertising was the beginning, but not the end. Surveillance economics were born at Google, migrated to Facebook, the first follower, and then became the default model for the tech sector, and now migrate across the normal economy from sectors as diverse as insurance and finance, retail and healthcare, education, real estate, agriculture, automobile production, and more every smart product, every personalized service, every app. These are all now loss leaders for behavioral data collection, extraction, and the surveillance dividend. Two decades later, the world's liberal democracies confront a tragedy, not of the commons, but of the uncommons. Today, the internet as a market project is a failed social experiment that leaves a trail of social wreckage in its wake, including the wholesale destruction of privacy, the nullification of fundamental rights, the intensification of social inequality, the poisoning of social discourse with toxic disinformation, 
divided societies, demolished social norms, weakened democratic institutions. The US and other democratic governments chose to look the other way during these two decades, in part because of their own interests in human generated data and obsessive response to the attacks of 9-11. The result was a political economic void filled by the antisocial and anti-democratic economic institution of surveillance capitalism. The corporations then and continuously during these two decades have learned how to own, operate and intermediate the vast information spaces of global social communications. This institutionalization was almost entirely unconstrained by public law, despite the fact that these systems and infrastructures are mission critical to every democracy. I have spent the last three years, I'm sorry, did I just say three years? That was a bit of wishful thinking. The last 43 years, I cannot hide it. <laughs> observing as the digital became a political economic force propelling our transformation into an information civilization. Over these last two decades, I've observed the once young internet companies morph into surveillance empires powered by global architectures of surveillance economics engineered for the domination of knowledge about people about society and the power that accrues to that knowledge. A century ago, corporate concentrations of power were understood as economic power and owners had all the authority on the strength of their property rights. The harms of concentration fell upon people in their economic roles as workers, consumers and competitors. It took decades of contest and collective action to eventually produce, yes, antitrust laws, but also new charters of rights for workers and consumers, the laws to protect them, the institutions charged with their enforcement and governance. As important as those creations remain today, they do not and cannot protect us from the new harms we face. In the age of surveillance capitalism, Corporate power is not primarily economic, but social. Its social harms are not confined to individuals as workers and consumers. They fall upon users, a strange new category of humanity that means all of us, all the time, everywhere. Ours is a young information civilization that has not yet found its footing in democracy because the social harms we face cannot be shoehorned into Cinderella's 20th century legal slipper. Now it is we who march naked, we who exist without the rights, the laws and the institutions purpose built to govern our digital century in the name of democracy. In an information civilization, principles of social order derived from the essential questions of knowledge, authority, and power. And if you remember nothing else from this talk, remember these three questions. Who knows? Who decides who knows? Who decides? Who decides who knows? Knowledge, authority, and power. The problem is that surveillance capitalist corporations, beginning with the giants, now hold the answers to each question though we did not elect them to govern on the strength of their property claims, the private surveillance empires have mounted a fundamentally anti-democratic epistemic coup, a revolutionary takeover of knowledge and knowing. They decide what is known, who can know it and to what purpose. The social harms that follow from this revolution leave lawmakers and the public continually whipsawed by each day's headlines, the latest atrocities, and our comprehension is thwarted 
by what I consider category errors, social harms, such as the destruction of privacy, defactualization of information, the massive scale behavioral modification of collectives and individuals, the rise of unaccountable power. These are siloed. They're treated as distinct phenomenon, unrelated phenomenon. And what happens is this leaves us in a kind of tangle, disorientation, fragmentation, confusion. It is my view that as long as we view these harms as distinct, unrelated crises, they will remain impossible to solve. The perspective of surveillance capitalism as a revolutionary institutional order offers a way out of this confusion. This institution reaches across the boundaries of individuals, organizations, sectors, communities, societies, nations, re-intermediating virtually all human engagement with the digital architectures, devices, products, services, and information flows that saturate our environments. Surveillance capitalism, like all institutions, is self-reproducing. No matter how much we plead with individual leaders to please, please change, they cannot change. Right now, all roads to economic and social participation lead through the institutional terrain of surveillance economics, a fact that has only grown more ferocious during these years of global plague. The economic institution of surveillance capitalism is the unified field in which the social harms we face are revealed as linked effects of a single cause, a unitary process. It unfolds in four stages, each a demonstration of economic cause and social harm effect, each developing the conditions for the next, each later harm deriving from and building on what went before. I'm gonna describe these very, very briefly. Stage one introduces an economic logic founded on the secret massive scale extraction of human data. And the social harm effect is, as I've mentioned, the wholesale destruction of privacy, which is a non-negotiable consequence of these most basic, most foundational, massive scale extraction operations. So we continue to discuss privacy, privacy laws, privacy rights, privacy protection, and so forth. The harsh truth is that privacy as we knew it in the year 2000 has been extinguished while surveillance capitalism careened through these last years of spectacular growth. With privacy out of the way, the path is cleared for stage two. Ill-gotten human data are concentrated within private corporations where they are claimed as corporate assets to be deployed at will. The social harm effect of this economic cause is a new form of social inequality, epistemic inequality, if you will, and this is defined as the growing gap between what I can know and what can be known about me. This is AI. And here is a look into the sanctuary of Facebook's AI backbone. And here we see in this sanctuary, this moment of transformation where the extreme inequalities of knowledge become available for extreme inequalities of power. So here we have a 2018 Facebook document that was leaked to the public and it's focusing on what it calls its AI backbone where it describes a prediction engine that ingests trillions of data points every day that's extraction, that's inequality. And then with it, a prediction service 
that turns out more than 6 million predictions per year. Six, <laughs> six million predictions per second. I was getting ahead of myself. Six million predictions per second. Six million behavioral predictions. That's us per second. That is the scale and scope of what we're talking about. And this begins to give us that X-ray vision into this turning point as this massive inequality of knowledge that we call artificial intelligence makes itself available for massive inequalities of power. And these new inequalities of power then come to fruition in stage three, where human data are weaponized as targeting algorithms and aimed back at their human sources, all of us, just as we saw in the account of 2016. But because more corrupt and inflammatory information has been shown to most reliably increase engagement, this economic cause produces social harm effects in the form of epistemic chaos expressed in degraded, defactualized information, more polarized discourse, hate, and extremism. Artificial power is expressed as targeting mechanisms create parallel social harms. So in the first instance, these targeting mechanisms are designed to maximize engagement in order to maximize extraction. And please understand that the word engagement, which we hear all the time, is a euphemism for those methods that increase the footprint of human data extraction. But now, as those operations are occurring, we see something else taking shape in parallel because targeting mechanisms are also used to shape the behavior of information producers and information users in order to align that behavior with the corporate, uh, commercial and political advantages to which all of these machine systems are geared. This means that behavior is shaped secretly from above in what amounts to a direct assault on human autonomy and the integrity of collective behavior. So far, the single most chilling takeaway from the Facebook documents that we've all been reading about is their concrete depiction of the realities behind these very words as well as the clear economic intentionality that drives them. We see Mr. Zuckerberg wantonly playing his own personal celestial keyboard of humanity's collective behavior, reinforcing or extinguishing the actions of billions of people at will as ordained by the economic imperatives to which he has pledged himself. He pounds this key or that and qualities of human experience and expression rise or fall. Content is more positive or negative. Anger is rewarded or ignored. News stories are more trustworthy or unhinged. Corporate information is showcased or suppressed. Publishers prosper or wither. Political discourse turns uglier or more moderate. A young person is more or less depressed or anxious. People live or people die. Key to this shocking picture is that Mr. Zuckerberg and his company are not alone. These secretive capabilities to tune, herd, and modify collective behavior are essential to surveillance capitalism's most routine operations. These facts suggest that the greatest threats to democratic life and individual sovereignty arise from the translation of artificial intelligence into artificial power. And it is this new power that provides instrumentarianism its distinctive signature 
of violence. The compounded interest from harms begetting new harms is measured in the sharp escalation of corrupt information, fractured societies, degraded mental health, and weakened democratic institutions. The center does not hold, but not because we, the people, are no longer capable of holding it. Rather, it's because both the center and the people are overwhelmed by an unrestrained economic force. Occasionally, the fog clears long enough to reveal a fourth stage, epistemic dominance, and here we find the growing power of tech giants eager to compete with democracy for the governance of what passes for society when their revolution is complete. This is where the corporate surveillance empires vie with democracy over fundamental rights and legal principles by leveraging their absolute control and unaccountable power over critical information systems and infrastructures. The aim is to substitute information systems for society and computational governance for democracy. They will be the lawmakers. So in the wind up, we can't fix all of our problems at once, but we won't fix any of them ever unless we reclaim the sanctity of information integrity and trustworthy communications as a necessary precondition to the resolution of all of our emergencies, from the breakdown of social solidarity to the fate of the earth and the survival of democracy itself. The abdication of our information and communication spaces to surveillance capitalism has become the meta crisis of every republic because it obstructs solutions to all other crises. We've stumbled into a future that we did not and would not choose. The sober truth is that democratic societies face a reckoning with the most basic questions. How do we structure, organize, and govern the global information and communication spaces of the digital century? How do we do this in ways that sustain and advance democratic values, principles, and aspirations? We don't have these answers for many reasons, beginning with the fact that we've only just begun to ask the questions. We've also been confounded by unprecedented conditions that mark a new phase in the technological development of our civilization. The answers we seek cannot be found in the back of the book and the book itself is not yet written. Finally, surveillance capitalism rooted and flourished under the tent of the market privileging ideologies associated with thinkers like Friedman and Hayek. This ideology has reigned, especially in the US and UK for five decades and counting. Most people, lawmakers included, assumed that the market would provide the answers and the rules of the game to govern those answers. Now we know better. Where does that leave us? Democracy is under the kind of siege that only democracy can end. Democracy is the only countervailing institutional order with the legitimate authority and power to change our course. If this crucial third decade is to be the tipping point, then every solution points to one solution, a democratic counter-revolution where new roads, our roads lead through, lead through new rights, new laws purpose built for our time and new public institutions to govern them, transparent and accountable to citizens. Make no mistake, this is the fight for the soul of our information civilization. For this to succeed, three conditions must be met. First, public awakening and mobilization. Second, a step change 
and lawmakers' comprehension and determination to act. And finally, a transnational dialogue and collaboration. Counter-revolution is signaled by a new conversation in which economic operations assumed to be settled, uncontestable and undiscussable are revealed as the self-serving inventions of ruthless and wily monopolists whose trillion dollar companies are built on a social harm machine that is on course to unravel the psychological, sociological and institutional bedrock upon which the very premise of democracy rests. Now, in my view, there are already important indications of an emerging convergence of public opinion and the views of vanguard lawmakers, hopeful signs of a new transatlantic dialogue and an accelerated pace at which the undiscussable is becoming discussable. New developments that suggest we may indeed be approaching a tipping point and capitalism social harm effects and the illegitimate artificial intelligence and the Ill illegitimate artificial power and a new zeitgeist in which these will no longer be tolerated. Now, rather than go into detail at this moment about what I see as some of these important new developments, I'd like to pause here and uh, make way for our, our questions and our discussion. And uh, because I'm, I'm very eager and interested in, in hearing from you, um, but to the extent that you are interested in hearing about what is happening in this political arena and what are some of the examples that have really caught my attention, then I'm thrilled to discuss them. So let me just finish with this very simple thought. Every time I, I get into this subject with people, which is usually a few times a day, I hear the question, isn't it too late? And the answer is no, it's not too late. They want us to believe it's too late. It's not too late. In fact, the time is just right. Why? Because now we know, now we know. Having said the time is just right, I'll close by stressing we do not have a moment to lose. Thank you so much. That was extraordinary. Thank you so much. Um, as you were speaking, you referenced the meta crisis that we are in, um, not Ironically, extraordinarily um, ironically, Facebook has a new name. It is called Meta. So um, we'll put that in the chat for the audience. <laughs> I have just one uh, transition question I'd like to ask you. And mm. you have a background as a philosopher. Um, you began your career as a student at University of Chicago, where Milton Friedman loomed quite large, and you elected to study the humanities. I wanted to invite you to speak about that choice. Many of our students, I think, feel pressure to pursue computer science degrees, which are wonderful, and business degrees, which are wonderful. But the work that you've done, um, I think, illuminates spaces that um, we've really needed to deeply understand. Could you speak to the value of the humanities education in your experience? You know, at the time, I never said to myself, well, do I study humanities or, or science or, uh, you know, uh, social science or whatever it may be. What I felt as an undergraduate was that um, I had to understand how to create meaning. In whatever my life brought, I needed to be able to confront any, any subject and any experience 
And I needed to know how to think powerfully to create meaning. And these are not words that I use retrospectively, Erica. This is how I thought about it at the time. And I felt if I can't create meaning, why am I here? Why am I spending all of this time on a formal education? I can read books by myself. I need to learn how to create meaning. And of course, being an undergraduate at Chicago is <laughs> the world's best place to do that. Um, my friends, especially young friends, students who are listening to me right now, let me go back to that um, when I misspoke earlier and I said three years instead of 43 years, 43 years. So let me tell you what I've learned. There's no point in getting educated about a set of answers that already exist. You want to get educated to learn how to think so you can find answers to questions that don't already exist so that you can stand at the edge of the unknown. I need you to be able to do that. We need you to be able to do that. Why? Because we are in a huge transformational moment, new material conditions. Yes, the, com the computer scientists got it first and they got there first, but what did they do with it? They created surveillance capitalism. <laughs> And now all of these incredibly rich, powerful technologies, the data that we need to make our lives better, the data and technologies we need to solve the most fundamental questions and problems and challenges of humanity. All of this is going to work to predict behavior for profit. That's not what we had in mind. So, what you do is you, you I had an incredible professor for part of my undergraduate life. Um, he's passed on now, his name was Jonathan Z. Smith. He was a historian of religions. And he always said, when it came to moral philosophy, you need a place on which to stand. You need ground to stand on where you have ideas about what is right and what is wrong, but what you believe and where you need to go and how you're gonna contribute and how you're gonna bring others with you. A place on which to stand, that's your moral center. That's your moral bearings. These are the things that thinking and all of the materials of humanities help you achieve. So. When I look back on the development of surveillance capitalism over two decades, I see really, really smart, incredible people who really got computer science and the whole new material world before anybody else, but they didn't have the moral bearings to create it and bring it to society in a way that would make all of us flourish, all of us prosperous, drive democracy to new heights and depths. That's a failure. That's a moral failure. That's a human failure. You can do better, and I'm counting on you to do better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I see from the questions that many in our audience already agree with you. It is not too late. The time is now. And I'm going to take this time to turn to a few of them. Um, they come in categories. I'll, I'll bring you two. Um, one is from Nina Gardner, who's actually in Italy, and she's a member of the Business and Human Rights Global Scholars Network. Um, she says this is fascinating and terrifying, and she thanks you. Um, her question is, how do we rein these companies in? Um, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. What are your policy suggestions? How do we protect democracy and society? And complementing that question is from Professor Moshe Varde, who was with us last month, um, a computer scientist. And he asks, are there any solutions other than breaking up big tech? Which might be where um, Nina's question is going. Would you care to speak to those? 
Well, um, funnily enough, I, uh, there, there are many good reasons to break up the big surveillance empires, but um, breaking them up will not solve the problems that I've just been discussing with you. If we imagine, you know, let's just imagine, uh, you know, we break up Google into four or five or however many different companies What's going on under the hood of each of those companies is still surveillance capitalism, because by breaking them up, we haven't created purpose built laws that challenge the very legitimacy of massive scale human data extraction. This is theft, as I've suggested. And if you don't have massive scale data extraction, you don't have these huge concentrations of knowledge, AI, in these companies. And if you don't have those huge concentrations, you don't have the targeting mechanisms that work both to increase instra- extraction and to modify collective and individual behavior in, in, the, uh, in, in ways that are aligned with the interests of the companies. So we immediately, um, we change the character of artificial intelligence And we change the character of artificial power because we take the raw material that is fundamentally illegitimate right out of the equation. They are not allowed to have my face. I didn't offer it. I didn't give it. I didn't know they were taking it. When they take my face, they take my anger. They take my joy. They take my my fear. They take my confusion. I did not give it. And they have no right to it. That's kind of a metaphor for the whole, you know, vast uh, operations of extraction that are occurring in our lives, in every venue uh, of daily life, uh, every moment of the day. So breaking them up, that song, I can't get away from the song every time I say those words, is hard to do, but, um, but even though There are real monopoly considerations here and breaking up can have an effect on that. Breaking up these companies into a bunch of small surveillance capitalists will intensify surveillance capitalist competition and therefore create an intensification of these operations, the the targeting, the uh, AP kinds of operations that drive prediction. and, And that's, of course, the the basis for the whole revenue wheel. So um, we've got different kind of work to do. That's why I use the word purpose built. All roads lead through law right now. The only solutions are law. And that's why all the solutions are politics. We're talking about collective action and we're talking about citizens uniting with lawmakers. And we're talking about laws that don't do what we had laws doing in the 20th century. Now we need laws that directly target the social harms and the economic causes behind these social harms. So that's why I laid it out for you as carefully as I did. We we get extraction and then we rescue privacy. Um, We target, concentrations of uh, personal data in corporate in the corporate sphere and we uh, restore knowledge equality. Uh, we restore knowledge e- equality we get rid of those concentrations no more targeting. no more targeting we take the legs out of its power and we eliminate the financial incentives for prediction. So purpose built, new laws, new inventions, just as you know, in the 20th century, we invented the, the rights and laws that protected workers and consumers. We didn't copy those from the 19th century. We invented them. That's our work today. Wonderful, thank you. There are some law professors on this call. I know it, I've seen their names. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of other questions that are changing, um, changing gears a bit. Um, Florian Matasbasser, asks, to what extent do you think neuroscience and the science of human psychology and behavior can contribute to understanding and curbing the power and 
exploitative extractive structure of these corporations. Well, <clears throat> let me go back to those three questions. Who knows, who decides who knows, and who decides who decides. So, you know, we're already seeing a keen interest in neuroscience from right within the heart of darkness that I've been describing. You know, Facebook, um, I, I've written about some of this work that uh, Facebook has published with distinguished uh, neuroscientists where they're uh, trying to um, read thoughts uh, and translate thoughts into language um, with, uh, with uh, you know, machine operations. So uh, your, your, your thinking, uh, I'm thinking about Erica and, and now we have a, a machine process that can actually uh, articulate Erica's name, Erica. So, and that's just one example. Um, there's a whole new field that's been developed um, within the within legal scholarship. Um, and this is a specifically de designed around um, a legal defense of the, um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm just blocking on the Latin term, uh, term for this. It's the legal defense of the interior space uh, that we associate with thought that, that has been considered as inviolable, inviolable. Um, th uh, the uh, terra interna, I, I, anyway, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just blocking on that uh, Latin term, but this is, this is now becoming an arena within legal scholarship because we already see, uh, you know, within the institution of surveillance capitalism, people developing assaults on this neurospace. And in fact, there is a group at Columbia um, that has um, taken the trouble to develop uh, something like a, a, declara a declaration of neurological rights, uh, of neuro rights, uh, because these assaults are, are, uh, are in the test phase. <laughs> these assaults are coming for our minds. So um, that's why political economics, it all comes back to these questions. And therefore we need law. We need law now, this decade. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you. One of the things <clears throat> I've appreciated about your book, um, for those who haven't read it, the subtitle speaks about the right to a human future. That's not one that's articulated yet in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it invites us to imagine a broader more legal framework, an expansive legal framework, one that is fit for the questions we've yet to ask. So thank you very much for that. There are two more questions that I see in the chat. Um, and one picks up on where you left off about um, how politics, the commerce moved to politics. So Tyler Bettleton um, asks, surveillance technology has seeped out from the economic titans into the hands of governments now. Could you discuss the connection between what you call surveillance capitalism and what I will call algorithmic authoritarianism as demonstrated most clearly in modern day China, but certainly not only there, thinking about our own NSA, FBI and other agencies, please comment. Yes, all right. Well, for the record, let's not equate the NSA with the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Yes, both uh, live and die by surveillance. But um, in China, these surveillance systems are governed by an authoritarian state. In America, these surveillance systems are still bound to constitutional constraints. They live in a democracy. And I say that not to be a Pollyanna, but to make a very critical point right on the topic of your question. And this critical point is precisely because our state surveillance apparatus, if you will, is bound and constrained by the US Constitution. This became the impetus, the motivation 
for these very same agencies and other actors within the US government to turn the other cheek, if you will, and allow the nascent surveillance-based startups to root and flourish over the last two decades. Um, very early in the uh, 2000s, as Google, for example, was developing these new capabilities that I've described to you to secretly hunt and capture uh, beh behavioral traces, data traces that could be extracted and codified as behavioral data for prediction. Uh, the NSA had a profound interest in these capabilities. And there are written documents that, that come out of the NSA stating, you know, we have to become more like Google. And uh, they even wrote a, a kind of pamphlet, a, a, a training document for folks within the NSA to teach them, here's how Google operates, here's what they do, here's how searches is, is put together. And we have to learn these same kinds of, of methodologies so we can apply them within our agency. So this has always been a symbiosis here where uh, we're going to allow these, these uh, companies to flourish because they can collect the data that we cannot collect because we are part of a democratic uh, society. And, uh, and then we can get that data from them when we need it. And in some ways we get the data from them uh, through the front door, they know about it. And in some ways we get the data from them through the back door, they don't know about it. And these are, of course, this goes back to Snowden and his uh, revelations uh, where on the one hand you had the PRISM program where that was the front door, but on the other hand, you had these other programs that involved undersea cables and things that apparently uh, even and and ran, you know, the the companies that the the private companies' knowledge of of what was occurring. So uh, there's this uh, wonderful uh, moment in 2013 where the then chief technology officer of the CIA is at a public conference, a, a giga ohm conference, speaking to a, a room of bored uh, engineers and you know tech folk and uh, publicly thanking Google and Facebook and AOL and Fitbit and uh, a whole bunch of other companies who are already in the, in, the, uh, in the thick of hunting and capturing behavioral data, publicly thanking them uh, because those are all the data flows that the CIA was using. And you can actually watch that on YouTube. <laughs> It's there. <laughs> so um, final note on this, uh, in the year 2000, comprehensive privacy legislation was being debated in the uh, US Congress. There was a proposal for uh, privacy legislation from the Federal Trade Commissioners, uh, majority of them making its rounds. If you were talking about the internet in the year 2000 or 2001 before September, you were talking about the yes or no's of privacy law, the scope or narrowness of privacy law. But after September 11th, 2001, you were talking about the internet, you're talking about total information awareness. It changed overnight. And that is where this symbiosis was born. We, we are still suffering from that legacy, but now I believe we're at a point where, as I suggested before, the tide is turning and that legacy perhaps will have run its course. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to combine the last two questions because they are interrelated and they shift from more the macro view of what must be done at the policy level to the individual level and what we can be doing. So Elsa Wyatt wants to know what can be done individually? How do we take our data back? How do we do undo the damage? How do we get out somehow? How do we prevent further damage? Which is related to Jonathan Rosen's question, um, which um, asks, a more nuanced way of the trade-offs we must 
engaged. So you don't talk about the overwhelming attraction and advantages of the information highway that have generated among people. What are we going to get out of it if we're forced to relinquish those benefits? So um, what's in it for us? What are the costs for us? What can we do? Well, the idea that, um, you know, the idea that the true um, miracle of information that we can access, uh, of all we can learn, of all we can do, of all we can see, of all the communications, these things are, are beautiful and we cherish them. And we don't want to live without them, nor should we. But this is like saying, huh, um, we're going to have to burn down the world because we all want to live in a warm house. We all want to live in a warm house. I want to live in a warm house. I'm sure you do. Everybody should be able to live in a warm house. But in order to live in a warm house, we shouldn't have to destroy the earth and all of its creatures. Right? I believe those two things uh, are, in, are, are separable. They are not the same phenomenon. What's happened is the fossil fuel industry uh, figured out at some point that the ways that it was selling people to warm their homes was also destroying the planet. They decided to hide that, to create disinformation instead of communicating the truth because it was more lucrative, more profitable, more profit maximizing for them uh, to externalize that, um, that uh, murderous consequence rather than actually change their business. They could still have been heating our homes in some brand new ways where today we'd all be healthier, happier, and probably more prosperous as well. So I think it's the same in this space. Was it Jonathan? Um, that uh, we all want data and we all deserve data. We all want digital technologies and we all deserve digital technologies. They should be solving the real needs of people and society. Data collection should be tied to fundamental rights. Data use should be tied to the public good. We should have privacy. We should be able to select as Justice Douglas um, uh, wrote about in his um, writing about the right to privacy. He wrote about the fact that every individual should be able to choose what is shared and what is private. That right to choose what is public and what is private is a right that we have lost. Why did we lose it? I call this an epistemic, our epistemic rights. Our epistemic rights are elemental epistemic rights to know ourselves, to know our own experience. We've lost those rights because we never knew that they had to be codified in law. We've always taken them for granted. It's only now that we've come to a point in the development of material civilization where such rights must become juridical rights if they are to exist at all. This is the evolution of rights, by the way, that happens over the centuries. We finally codify something that we once took for granted because um, conditions have changed and it now comes under threat. Such was the history of uh, freedom of speech. So. Uh, by all means, give us a digital future. But as I suggested earlier, what is incumbent upon us now is to figure out how is this digital future one that advances and deepens democratic values and democratic governance, just as the Chinese have learned how to design and deploy digital technologies for a future that advances and deepens their authoritarian form of governance. So back to the individual, how does the individual have an impact on this? Well, of course, in your own family, you work to maintain the, 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 um, the joyfulness, the physical health and the mental health of all members. And long before the Facebook, um, whistleblower documents that we're, that we're all reading, um, there, there have been a, a slew of 
you know, really deep professional, high class uh, um, uh, research efforts that have shown unequivocally the negative mental health consequences of uh, Facebook, especially engagement in social media generally. This has been known. I, I have a whole chapter about it in the book. This is well known. Uh, and I also, in that same chapter, I quote a Facebook marketing executive who's bragging about the fact that um, first uh, we engineer our operations so that uh, the, the young people want to look at our pages. And then second, we engineer them so that they can never look away. <laughs> These things are out there, friends. So of course, um, in our families, we wanna keep everybody happy and healthy, go for a walk, um, go breathe trees, um, you know, go do exercise, hang out with each other, love each other, find your friends, be face to face, all of that. These are, this is the material of true mental, psychological health and well-being. But when it comes to how do we change the situation, that's collective action. That means if you're a student, grab another student in your left hand and another student in, in your right hand, and they extend the chain and you extend the chain until you have a group that's called collective, and you can then engage in collective action. So you can organize your campus and you can have a boycott social media day, boycott Facebook day, boycott Google day, boycott Amazon day, whatever you choose, boycott apps day. And then go to the state legislature, talk to them. Most importantly, you all charter a bus or a 20 vans and you go to Washington and you go up and down those hallways and you knock on every door and you tell our lawmakers that we need laws to end surveillance capitalism, to end the illegitimate extraction of our data and all the power over us that that produces. And guess what's gonna happen? They are going to welcome you. They are gonna say, hallelujah, where have you been? I'm so glad you're here. Because who knocks at their doors? The lobbyists. They need you. They need all of us. They need to hear from us. They need to feel us at their backs. They need us to give them cover, to know what they, to do what they increasingly know is the right thing to do. And there are more and more individual lawmakers who want to do the right thing. They want to get out on that frontier. They want to change the trajectory back toward a democratic digital future. And we as citizens give them cover. So faculty organize, students organize. These are not unions. They're new kinds of organizations around your interests, your neighborhoods, your communities, whatever it may be, this is how we make it happen. Wonderful. Thank you. I feel inspired to go make it happen. I know there's so many people who share that view. And it doesn't have to be this way. We see legal reform progressing in Europe and other places. Um, thank you for being instrumental in advancing that work. Um, to our audience, I thank you very much for your time. Um, I know it's virtual, but please join me in thanking our guest. Um, this is a series of conversations that the Tanner family and the OC Tanner Foundation are committed to because we've identified our artificial intelligence as important and something we need to be talking about around the world. So I hope you will continue this conversation and join me in continuing to learn. We put some resources in the chat. This recording will be available to registrants on our website, as well as a list of additional reading resources. So um, please join me in thanking Professor Zuboff. Professor Zuboff, thank you so very much. Thank you, Erica, and thanks to all of you who joined us today. Um, <laughs> good health, happiness, go forward, change the world. We'll take up the charge, thank you. Um, please join us in next month when we will host Nettie Akorafor, an African futurist 
writer whose newest book actually takes up um, a corporate actor in a distant future. So building on these themes, continuing to imagine human futures as we exist in an increasingly informational digital age. Thank you all. Thank you.